Hello, everybody, and welcome to our first night of Java Programming One. It is the spring semester of 2024. It is January 16th, uh, and it is uh, 7.50 at night. This is a late class, and, and thank you all for being awake enough to be here. Um, we are going to uh, begin by going through the syllabus, and then we'll uh, take a quick look at how uh, the course operates and you know, how the course shell is put together. And then we'll uh, try to get rolling right away on getting uh, software installed. And with any luck, we might even get our hands on some code tonight before we get out of here. That, that's my, my grand goal. So let me uh, take us over uh, in Blackboard here to the syllabus instructor information and course calendar link on the left sidebar. You will see a link to the syllabus here. Um, you have a choice. You can download it. You can print it. Uh, you can just watch my screen if you want. You can look at it on your screen, whatever works best for you. Um, you know, it's all about flexibility here, uh, generally speaking, but I'm going to open it on my screen and, and read through the document. Um, you guys have all been here at Gateway long enough now to know that, you know, the, the syllabus process is kind of something we all have to do as instructors as we begin a course. Um, a syllabus is basically an informal contract between myself, yourself, uh, and the school as to what we are delivering, how we're delivering it, and what expectations you're expected to meet uh, in order to be successful. Um, the course is called Java Programming One. It is, uh, I think, I don't know if it's a first semester course or a second semester course, depends on if you're part-time or full-time. Um, but what I will tell you about Java as a programming language arguably it might be the most important programming language out there right now in terms of uh, professional usage and job availability. Uh, Java is used to program everything from you know, typical software to mobile apps to um, you know, the computer systems that are in your car or your refrigerator or your other types of devices. Java is very pervasive. The other important aspect of Java being that it's what we call a C style language based on the original C programming language. It uses all the similar conventions of those languages um, and is probably the most popular of all of them in terms of actual usage for professional development. Java is a programming language that is uh, multi-platform. Um, and we'll talk about this as I start, you know, sort of lecturing, I guess. But the original motto for Java was build once, run everywhere. Because in the old days when people would write computer code, if they wrote a computer program for Windows, they couldn't pick up the code and take it over to a Mac and create software for the Mac because it used different tools and different libraries. It just wouldn't work. Java was one of the first languages that allowed us to literally be able to code on a mainframe or code on a personal computer, regardless of the operating system and, and what other software is on there. Um, it basically does that through the uh, use of what we call a virtual machine, um, which we'll learn all about. And in Java, the virtual machine is called the JVM or the JRE. It's a, kind of a lot of acronyms I'm going to be throwing at you. Um, it also really doesn't matter too much what equipment you use in this class. We can typically get Java to work on just about any piece of hardware. Um, when you get to Java programming too, it becomes a little challenging on a Macintosh, but for the most part, you can do it on any platform, at least at this level. All right, let's, let's go through the details of the syllabus now. Uh, the course is formally called Java Programming 1. There is a follow-up course called Java Programming 2. Both are required for the web degree in both uh, the one-year diploma and the um, the two-year degree, you know, the, it, it's required in both of those. Um, this is a stacked section. And what that means is we actually have two sections linked together. Uh, the 3W7A is the fully online asynchronous section that does not have required meetings. Uh, the 3WY1 is the one that you guys are all attending, which is the live Zoom session, which will happen every Tuesday evening from 7.50 to 9.50 between January 16th and April 16th. Um, that is a total of 14 weeks of instruction uh, and it will go fast. And you guys, uh, I always say that at the beginning of every semester and then I always feel like I blink my eye and it's April, you know, like time goes like that kind of quick sometimes. Um, there 
is no uh, classroom to go to for this class. Everything is done online. Um, I do, uh, and I should say, I, I will have office hours that I will hold um, basically for roughly an hour preceding class from 7 to 7.45 is how I list it on my schedule. So um, if you guys are looking for the office hours as that's listed right here, that's in Blackboard as to when that is. But I'm just telling you that basically every Tuesday evening before class starts, I'll be here at, at least a half hour to 45 minutes before you arrive at a minimum. And so if you need extra help or have questions or heck, if you just wanna come and hang out and get here early, that's fine too. Um, because our time frame is really short in the classroom, we operate the Zoom session in what we call a blended format, meaning it's half online on Zoom and half online without Zoom, right? And then it's like, well, how does that work? You know, so there's going to be a portion of the stuff that you do that you won't you won't do in the classroom. I will initially start out, and you guys know this about me if you've had like Python or web programming, doing a lot of lecturing. Web programming actually has a lot of lecturing in it because it's a lot of material to go through. Uh, but in my coding classes, I, I very rarely lecture during class time. I usually dive right into the code and work on the exercises. So my expectation every week with you guys will be that you will have read the chapter that you're supposed to read, tried the sample exercises, and then watch the lecture videos, maybe code along with me in, in the demonstrations, and then come to class and work on the exercises. And if you follow that process, by the time you get to class, you know, and, and I want you to hear that really carefully, I will help you through the homework. So if you had the Python class with me, it's gonna be kind of the same as how we did Python. The one exception is, is we won't do cahoots in this class. If we do, they'll be very, very rare. Um, but we will get kind of lecture material as I'm coding the assignment. So like I'll be typing a snippet of code and then I'll talk about, you know, what that means and how it works and, and all that. Um, I've been teaching in that style now for a while and I find it to be very effective because, you know, the, the, flip, the flip of it is really that you would come to class, I would just lecture and say, well, there's the homework, good luck, I'll see you next week, you know, and then people, hit me up with a gazillion emails and get half the work wrong or don't do it or whatever. And so I find it's much better that when we code in class together and you get stuck on something, we can all work together and fix it. And I think it's really an effective way to learn how to do programming, at least on, on, on the introductory level. And that's what this is. This is gonna be introductory level uh, Java programming. Um, it is a three credit course. And so there is that amount of work that goes with it. There's basically, four hours of contact time during the week, two of them being virtual. Um, and then what I normally tell people is for every classroom hour, you usually triple the amount of work, triple the hours outside the classroom as to the amount of time that you would expect to spend doing all those activities, reading, watching videos, writing code, doing homework, all of those things. So, you know, it's a time commitment. It's a, you know, I, I estimate it's about a 15 to 16 hour time commitment per week once we get rolling on the material. If you really want to do well in it, and I would encourage you guys to try to do well because it really is a, a profitable career path is a polite way to say it. Um, software development right now is hotter than ever. Um, they're expecting uh, 1,700 new jobs over the next year in the state of Wisconsin writing computer code. That, that's how big it is, just in Wisconsin. And we're not California or Texas or one of those kind of places where they have a lot of coders. Um, all right, most of you do know how to get a hold of me already. Email is definitely my preferred method of communication. If you do happen to call me, um, you know, it goes to voicemail. I'm hardly ever at my desk, although my phone does, my desk phone rings through Zoom uh, now. So like if you were to call me now at my office number, I'd get a little thing that would pop up on my screen. Hey, so-and-so is calling. And then, oh, you got a voicemail. Um, but I, I recommend email is really the better way to, to reach me. Uh, if you really need to talk, you know, like I'm talking now, uh, Zoom is really a better option because if you're stuck on something, you know, you can't share screens on the phone, you know, but you can on Zoom and then I can help you. I can even take control of your screen that way if it's needed. All right. Well, 
let's let's talk about the the course fundamentals now. You know, and it says here, you know, this will introduce you basically to both Java and this concept of called object oriented programming, which has been the prevalent programming style now for a good thirty years plus. Uh, object oriented programming basically means that we're creating uh, reusable blocks of code, and um, there's a whole notation and syntax that goes with it. If you've already taken the Python class, which many of you have, at the very end of that course, we learned a little bit about objects and classes and how to instantiate and how to inherit uh, programming code. Here, we get into object-oriented programming in chapter three. So it's just a couple of weeks away that we dig into it because with Java, it really is all about being object-oriented. And once you see how that works, it's kind of like a magic sauce. It's 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 amazing, like the stuff that you can do with it. Um, we're not only going to learn about like the the basics of the Java language, um, but we're going to do a whole lot of like learning how to debug code, how to spot mistakes, and how to fix them. Um, and then um, using that to basically solve uh, programming problems. You know, so like if you think of like. If you had the, the Python course, you know, you'll, you'll be presented with a scenario and then you have to write code to solve that scenario. Now, normally when I will give you homework, I, I'm gonna have the expectation that you at least try to do the homework before you come to class. But some people either don't have the time or don't have the confidence and that, that's absolutely fine. That's why I code through the exercises during class. And, in, and I will tell you right up front that it is possible that I come up with a solution for a program that looks different than yours, but they're still both valid. You know what I mean? So it's like, if you want to get the house painted, well, I could use a brush, I could use a sprayer, I could use a roller, you know, or I could just skip it all together, right? But either way, the house gets painted, you know, and that, that's really kind of what we're looking at. We do have a book that we use for this class. Um, I will tell you that it is imperative that you get it immediately because all the homework is based on the book. All the readings are based on the book. Um, and if if you're waiting to get it, it, it will cause issues for you in terms of homework completion and getting to learn the materials. The book is by an author named Joyce Farrell, who is really well known in IT circles for writing excellent introductory programming books, probably better than anybody that, that I've um, looked at you know, in terms of a textbook. Um, this is uh, in its ninth edition now. I think it's about to go to 10th. Um, we've been using it here at Gateway for a really long time. I really like her writing style. She has a great way of explaining things that are very complicated. Um, not that it's like a fun read, but it's not a bad read for a programming book. Um, so I do want you to make sure that you get that uh, as soon as possible. If you have issues getting the book, let me know. There's a number of different ways that you can purchase it. If you take this ISBN number, and I'm just gonna highlight it right now and search on Google just to show you how easy you can find it. You can go to Amazon, for example. You don't have to go to our bookstore, right? So if our bookstore is out of the book, for example, um, you, you can go elsewhere to get it. Uh, right now, it looks like they're selling loose leaf versions of it um, that are running somewhere in the range of 60 to $108. That's a, actually a really, really good price. Um, you know, because I, I think that if you bought like a hard copy, at least it used to be this way, buying you, well, actually that's even a really good price for loosely for $108. This book used to sell in the range of like $200 plus uh, just a few years ago. Another option that you have is that instead of buying a textbook, you could also uh, buy an electronic copy. So an ebook. Um, that's the format that I've been using lately. I do have a physical book but I, I just leave it at my office and then I just pull up the book inside the course shell. If you buy an ebook version directly from Cengage, it is possible that you can go to our homepage here and I have a, a link right here if you buy it from Cengage directly and then you can link up your ebook so when you click here, it goes directly to your version of it. Um, now, one thing I will say about Cengage as a book provider is they do also offer this thing called Cengage Unlimited. Um, and I wish the bookstore would list that for us uh, in, in the book list, but that basically allows you to pay one fee 
and have access to any of their textbooks that you want to use, not just the one. And it's usually cheaper than buying it. Um, you can also rent the book. And so a lot of people choose to do that. Um, so if you have the question, will we use the Java 1 book in the Java 2 class? The answer is no. We use a different book for the Java 2 class than we do for the Java 1 class. So the Java 1 book is one that might be wiser to rent. The other thing you can do is you can always look for used copies too. Sometimes people uh, unload them really cheap. Um, that's really kind of all up to you. But, you know, I, my recommendation is get an ebook and rent. Those are probably the most affordable options. Or look at Cengage Unlimited. I think you can do that through our bookstore, if I remember right. It might not be the best price, though. I, I think it pays to shop around a little bit. I just clicked on the first link, you know, that came up. Um, so I don't know, like, what Cengage does directly. You can see the price, the price on it actually has come down. I'm not sure why that happened, but that's great for you guys. Um, and the e-textbook is 136, I think. Yeah, well, you don't need MindTap if you're wondering, if you're asked. Here they don't offer a, a rental um, option, I think. I don't know. My recommendation is shop around, find the best price, but please try to get it right away. The one reason it is a smart idea to get an ebook, of course, is because once you like put in your credit card or whatever, you know, your financial aid information, you get instantaneous access. So you don't have to wait for it to be shipped and then hope it arrives, you know, and then you get weather or stuff like that. Uh, it's, it's really kind of the smart way to go. You know, so shop around. Um, there's other providers like Chegg is a big one. Uh, of course, Amazon. I'm trying to think of some of the other big providers. Uh, Biblio, that's a big one too. But shop around, see what you can find. Uh, used copies are fine. Um, but please make sure it's the ninth edition, if you would. All right. So going back to the syllabus, um, so you need to have the book in terms of like what you need for technology. Um, probably what you've been using so far is probably going to be okay. So if you've done other coding classes, it'll probably work for this. Uh, basically, a modern computer system is what I recommend. Um, and you have really a variety of different software tools that you can use to create code in Java. Um, I have my preferences um, and I will, regardless of what my preferences are, I will show you a bunch of different options and you can choose the one that's best for you. Uh, one that I've been experimenting with recently that I've been kind of reluctant to use for Java is Visual Studio Code. Um, and I installed it on my other machine, but I haven't tested it yet to see how well it works for the code. But that, that should work really if you're, um, you know, if you're a Visual Studio Code fan, uh, I will talk about all the software options. I have my preferences um, for a number of different reasons, but you ultimately can choose your own. We will need to install some software, so I'm hoping to do that tonight because the way that we install the software is really important. <clears throat> you know, generally speaking, on an intro level Java course, um, you can kind of install any editor with any of the Java um you know, runtime environments and SDKs and stuff, and it just works and it'll be fine for the first course. But then when you get to the second course, you're gonna be like, well, how come this doesn't work for that? Well, because the second course is what we call enterprise level programming, where we connect with databases and websites and, and do higher level stuff. And then you have to have all, you know, higher level tools. So the way that I usually do it in Java one is I give you those tools now so then when you get to Java 2, you don't have to do anything. You're just all set. You know, then you can just code. You know, that's kind of my philosophy. You, you're free to operate in any fashion you want, as long as you can get the code typed up. Um, and, and there's a lot of really good tools for Java out there, including online editors, if you're interested. Um, the competencies for the course are listed here. Uh, so it shows you basically uh, what you're about to learn. So... Uh, sequential coding, conditional statements, uh, iterative programming or looping, arrays, object-oriented, uh, classes, inheritance, and polymorphism, exception handling, 
Uh, we'll touch a little bit upon doing GUI stuff, but GUI really happens mostly in course number two. And then we learn how to document our code. Those are the main objectives for what we're doing here. Um, every single one of you has had me in a class before, so I feel like the rest of the stuff should go pretty quick. Um, you guys know I don't grade on attendance, but I do grade on participation. Um, that's 15% of your grade. So if you show up, do your work, smile once in a while, laugh at my jokes, you pretty much earn all those points. Uh, the assignments is where most of the points are, and that, that would be our weekly stuff. So when we do um, you know, every weekly assignment, those are more important, frankly, than maybe even the tests when it comes down to it. We will have a final project in this class um, that will be a culminating experience of all the stuff that we learn. Um, and I will help you start the project, but I won't finish it for you. you know, so I'll get you, you know, to the top of the hill and push you down with the sled and you'll get, you know, it's up to you to, to land at the bottom, <laughs> you know, um, bad analogy, but whatever. Um, I, I do list quizzes and exams here, but actually this should just say exams. We have a midterm exam and we have a final exam. Um, they're not super point heavy. There's more points in the assignments and more points in that final project than uh, the, the quizzes and exams, or excuse me, the exams. Uh, this is the grading scale we use. You guys should know this pretty well. For any of our IT program courses, ones that count towards your degree, uh, your expectation is that you earn 74% or 74 points. Um, you guys should know by now that the way that I do my classes, I have a 100 point system, I call it, which means there's 100 points on the table that you can earn. Um, and you can directly attribute each point that you earn to a percentage point on the grading scale. So your goal in this class is to earn at least 74 points to get to at least the C, so you can count this class as a you know, success and then move on to the next class. If you don't get up to the C, unfortunately, you will have to retake the class. Right? And I will try to work with you as best as I can. You know, if you're struggling to get up to that level, um, the first thing that you can do to be successful, real frankly, is show up every week, you know, um, and, and do your readings and do your work and put in the time and the effort. Um, what does seem difficult and confusing, I will assure you, is achievable if you just stick with it. Um, I'm probably a really good case example of like, I was not the, sh you know, the, the sharpest stick in, in you know, the quiver or whatever, you know, when I was learning this stuff as a young person, um, it took me a lot to really understand. It took me many years to really kind of get it. I, I mean, I graduated with a bachelor's degree in computer science and I didn't feel like I was ready to code. If you guys stick with our program in the way that we teach here at Gateway, after your two-year degree, you will be way more ready to code than I was coming out of my four-year degree. Part of it is just teaching style. When I went to school, the teachers wrote code on the chalkboard. We didn't have computers in class. We had a chalkboard, paper, and pencil. You'd write the stuff down in your notebook. Then you'd hustle over to the computer lab, where sometimes you'd have to wait for hours to get an open seat. And then you'd type in your code. And hopefully you wrote your notes right, you know, and then you typed it and it would work. Can you imagine? But we're going to be in class together. We're going to be coding. The moment you have a problem, we'll take a look at your screen and we'll fix it, you know? And that's such a better way to learn. I would have felt much less frustrated, you know, when I was younger, if I would have learned that way. But we just didn't have the tech back, back then. Computers are really expensive and hard to come by. Um, so that's your goal, 74 points uh, for the class. Um, we, we will have the two exams. I think I talked about that already. Uh, we will have midterm grades that will post. I think it's March 1st that they will post. So our midterm exam will be due on that date. We'll be you know, roughly halfway through the course at that point. Um, my policies for grading work are basically like this. I will post an assignment and I will list what you need to do. If you can turn it in on time, it's correct and submitted in the way it's supposed to be submitted you can pretty much count on earning all of your points. If it's late, there's problems with it, uh, or you're not following the instructions, then you start to see point deductions. Very often, I will um, allow people the uh, option to 
fix things and then resubmit it to get the rest of their points. Like, you know, with code, and you'll realize this, you know, especially with Java, you might forget a semicolon and it makes the whole program break, right? And you're just not seeing it to fix it. You know, sometimes that's dependent on the tool a little bit. Um, it doesn't mean that you're dumb. You just missed one character, right? So I give people the opportunity to fix it. I won't, I'm not going to penalize you real heavily on anything like that. Um, if stuff does become late, um, there's a, a few policies that I have in place. I have like the one week, two week rule. The one week rule is basically if you're turning in something, okay, let's say you're working on a set of exercises and you only got half of them done, something like that. Turn in what you have before the due date. And then I will give you one extra week with no late penalty to finish it. But I need to see that you're working on it. If you miss the due date with your partially completed work, that offers off the table. You just, you got to take a hit on it. You know, I just want, I want you to keep active on it. Now I do give you ample time to turn things in. So for example, um, if there's a set of exercises that we're going through in class, they're not due that night. They're due usually a day or two or three after class. So you have time to leave class, work on it a little bit, clean it up, make it really good, and then turn it in and not be late. So I, I try to give you that opportunity. The other reason I do that is if you're going to be a person that works ahead on the code and finishes it before you come to class and you're just comparing the solutions, um, you know, it, it kind of works in your favor if you have a problem because then you can come to class ask a question and fix it and still get it in on time without taking a late hit. You know, that, that's kind of my philosophy. Now, anything that happens to be two weeks late or more, the most you're going to earn on that assignment is half the points. I sometimes fudge that a little bit, you know, based on circumstance, but generally speaking, um, that's not a recipe for success, right? Don't, don't turn in work late, you know, is really kind of the general rule. Um, if, uh, you guys have had me before, you probably have seen this and probably used it, right? Like, so let's say, you, you know, my, my tip on this coupon thing is basically that you can use it really for any regular assignment. You can't use it for tests or extra credit or stuff like that. But let's say you get to, towards the end of the course and, and there's an assignment and you're like, man, I, I'm so busy with projects and finals and work and kids and life. And I just don't have time to do this assignment. You can come in here to the syllabus take a screenshot of that coupon, turn it in in place of the assignment, and I'll give you two points towards that assignment. A lot of the, the homework assignments towards the end, the regular chapter assignments are usually two, three points, sometimes four points, uh, but two points are better than no points, right? So there's some points on the table for you that you can scarf up. Um, the other thing that I do is I try to offer a number of extra credit opportunities, and I might increase those offerings uh, this time around uh, for those, especially they get bored if, if it's not moving fast enough for you, because I get those people too. Um, but the extra credit assignments are always encouraged because they're positive points only. There's no negative points involved. Um, and like, let's say like if you do bad on a, like the midterm or something, doing extra credit to make up the points is really wise, right? Because that way you know, you're not you know, diminishing your overall score. If you do have circumstances that are throwing you off track, and let's face it, folks, life happens usually when you least want it to. Um, please, first thing you do is contact me and let me know what's going on. And so I can like make arrangements. Like if you need more time for homework, you know, you're, you know whatever your situation is. Uh, at this point in my teaching career, I think I've kind of heard just about every kind of scenario that happens to people. And I've had some people have really bizarre, like, you know, multiple bad things happen to them in a short period of time. And the fact that they even want to still be in school, it just amazes me. Um, but I can't help you out if you don't let me know. I mean, that, that's kind of the big thing. And it's not something we have to talk about during class. We do it outside of class. Um, but please keep me informed if anything's going on that's messing you up and making it difficult for you to be in school. We're not here to punish you. We're here to help you, right? Um, and if you're in a situation where you got a good portion of your coursework done, something happens and you can't finish up the semester, we can give you more time to finish the work and be successful. So always keep that in mind. Um, the grading policies, I, I think I 
talked about this already uh, pretty much. Um, basically, do it right, turn it in on time, follow the instructions, you'll get all your points. Right? Keep in mind, I'm helping you write the code, so it should be right. You know? um, so that, that, you know, that's the hard part. If you do have questions about your grades or you think that I graded you incorrectly, please let me know as soon as you can. Uh, I'm, I do on occasion make mistakes. Um, probably the most notable one is, let's say you turn in something late, I might drop a zero in that spot and then you're turning it in and I grade it and you get points, but it doesn't show up in your grade book. That, that happens once in a while because uh, I have to do a grade override on that. So you just let me know basically. Key dates for the class are listed here. Uh, two sections combined, 3W7A and 3WY1. We are 3WY1, if you're wondering. So those are the Zoom sections. Um, April 16th is our end date. If you choose to voluntarily drop, you have until uh, the 31st of January. Uh, what that means is if you, you know, basically remove yourself from the course, you still get some form of a refund if you paid out of pocket or financial aid. Um, if the course is kind of a train wreck for you and it looks like you're heading for an F, um, what I recommend to people is don't let that happen. Don't just like walk away and not do anything. You have until March 26th to do a formal withdrawal, which puts a W on your transcript instead of an F. An F has a zero GPA impact. So in other words, you put an F in there, it'll lower your average on your GPA. A W doesn't do anything doesn't look good, but it doesn't har harm your GPA, you know, so uh, just keep that in mind. All of you have passed the census date that you got to show up basically the first two weeks, otherwise you lose your financial aid uh, or other financial resources. Um, I also have a drop period that I can exercise between February 1st and the 7th. Um, and that's if like, if, if you're not showing up, not communicating, not turning in work, any of that stuff, uh, I have the option to to remove you. Very rarely have I ever done that, by the way. Uh, midterm grades post on March 1st. Final grades will probably post a day or two after the 16th, if you're wondering. All right. Um, this listing here, which is of the, the listing of all the assignments, due dates, and points, uh, and the rough calendar that we have for this course, uh, is also listed inside of Blackboard separately in the same area with the syllabus. But I put it here in the syllabus since I had it available. Um, it's kind of an overview. The one on the right just kind of shows like what chapters we're covering during any given week. Um, that should be pretty accurate all the way through. Um, and then here it shows exactly which set of exercises are due during even, any given week with the due dates. This one is subject to change though. Sometimes we go faster or slower and I change the due dates or change the point values or add an assignment or remove an assignment. Um, this should be fairly accurate though, but if you want the actual due dates for an assignment, the only way you can really get it is to click on that assignment title and then the due date pops up. It's a date and a time. Sometimes the time is pertinent. Um, Midterm is one of those examples where the time is pertinent because you have until March 1st at noon to turn stuff in. But generally, any, anything else is due at 11.59 uh, p.m. on the day listed. So at the very end of the day uh, is the due day. All right, that's the syllabus, folks. Any questions about any of that stuff? You guys good? All right, let's, uh, let's do this. Let's come out of the syllabus now, and I'm going to go back to the course shell. And in the course shell, and depending on where you're looking here, um, if you're in unit zero or uh, looking at the syllabus directly here, you will uh, notice that um, once you're done, you should go to the syllabus acknowledgement discussion board and create a post indicating that you have read and understand the syllabus. The discussion boards are through this link here. I don't really use those a lot, by the way. Uh, the syllabus acknowledgement is one of them. You can see uh, a bunch of people have already acknowledged, and I'm assuming that some of them are not even in this uh, session. Well, some of you are, um, but some of these are our online people that are joined up with us. All you have to do to acknowledge the syllabus, by the way, is you go up here and you click this thing that says create thread. Uh, 
you know, type something in like uh, syllabus and then something to the effect of, I have read the syllabus and understand. And then my standing joke is, and will obey. But, <laughs> you know, do your best, you know, uh, basically. I just want to know that you've seen it and that you understand that that's how we're going to operate. Um, this does earn points. Uh, I forget how many points it is. I think it's like one point or a half point or something like that. So it's worth doing just for that. Um, so please make sure you do that. I, I would recommend that you just do it immediately, like right now, as you're either watching the video or in class, why waste time? You know, just do it. You will also notice that um, once we dig into some of these units here, that there's a introduce yourself uh, thing. This is also a required and graded activity. But what I do want to tell you is you don't have to overshare. Uh, you don't have to tell people your whole life story. Some people do anyhow. Um, if you guys want to share contact info inside there, that's up to you too. So sometimes people like to connect and form study groups or make friends or whatever. That's all on you, right? I just want to see that you posted something in there and then I will give you a point. So there's two point earning activities right there in the discussion board. Um, the introduce yourself might take a little longer than the syllabus one. Depends on how verbose you want to be. All right, going back to that same entry here, uh, I also want to point out a couple more things. You can always come back here and read the syllabus um, if you want. And, you know, you know, you might want to refer to it maybe for the coupon at some point. Um, um, or, you know, what my policies are, for example, or the ISBN number for the book, you know, that kind of thing. So it's always going to be sitting there. Um, this is the same a listing of points and a rough calendar and detailed due dates that I had in the syllabus, same image basically, um, but you can always refer to it here. But I wouldn't take this as gospel truth on those due dates. This is just a helpful guide. This is my plan as of today, but plans changed. All it takes is one weather event in the winter to change your plans, you know, it doesn't take much. I was, I'll be real frank, I was surprised I didn't call off school today for as cold as it was, I had a 7.30 a.m. class with high school students on campus. Um, and I think it was minus eight when I got there. You know, I was like, holy cow, man, it's cold. Uh, yeah, not, not fun, by the way. I was wishing that was an online class like this one is because <laughs> I, I would not want to be out in the cold even right now. At the very bottom of this page, I do have my uh, instructor information. And this is kind of a combination of my contact info and my calendarized schedule for classes. Uh, this is us down here, the Java programming one. I'll zoom in just a little bit, um, see if I can do that. Um, so I, I show you when the classes are, I also show you when my office hours are. And because I know that this is one of those courses where people do need help, right? Coding is always, especially intro level stuff. Uh, that's why I have those office hours here. If you know you're going to come to office hours, what I would recommend that you do is send me an email and say, hey, are you going to be there for office hours tonight? Because sometimes I have stuff that happens that pulls me away. Um, and if I know that, I will be there and, you know, and, and typically office hours, the way I operate them, if there's multiple people needing help, it's first comes, first serve, you know, or if we set a certain time, we go at that time. Um, but that will happen every week. And like I said, you're always welcome to come to the, to the Zoom um, you know, as early as seven o'clock, if you know, hopefully I'm around, <laughs> I'm not going to guarantee that I'm around, but hopefully I should be around. Um, and, uh, even just hang out, you know, sometimes watching other people get help is helpful, real frankly. Um, so you can see that I have all these other courses that are running plus my online sections as well. Right. So that's just helpful. There's another office hour. Uh, session that I do earlier on Tuesdays, like right around the lunch hour, uh, as a precursor to my Apple Swift programming class. Really cool class, by the way. Um, I really enjoy teaching it, and I think the students enjoy taking it. All right, let's go now to the uh, the home page of of our course. <clears throat> I'm going to go back to 100% Zoom here, uh, and you can see right now I'm in edit mode. So you can see all the unit folders. There are, you know, nine units of instruction plus unit zero. And then there's a final project folder and an exam folder. 
All of these are hidden right now. Um, and I do that on purpose. I don't want to overwhelm you with all the stuff you're going to do in the semester because, you know, frankly, it gets intimidating when you're like, oh, I got to do all that. You know, that really can throw some people off. It, it increases stress levels a lot. Um, we're going to start out slow and gentle and we will ramp up quick enough, you know, and some of these units, I, and I, I don't remember exactly which ones. There's a few units here that we do that we spend uh, a couple of weeks on them as opposed to one week. A lot of the units are one week only, some are two weeks. Um, it just depends. If they're two week units, I usually have two sets of assignments to go with them. So we're basically chunking up the chapter or doing uh, multiple chapters at the same time. It just depends on, on the material. We do get most of the way through the book, but not all the way through the book. You, you are of course, welcome at any point to self-study the stuff that we don't cover. Uh, and there's a lot of it in the book, you know, uh, Java is a very deep topic. <laughs> I, you know, I mean, I could probably teach like three, four, five Java courses that are three credit and still have more material to cover. You know, Java is that big and pervasive. Um, the layout of the core, the core shell is, um, you know, because I am a, a, a web designer by trade, you know, I, I like to set up my course shells at like web pages. So I have a home page. All the units of instruction are on the home page. And on the sidebar, there's no subfolders anywhere. It's one click to go to anywhere in the course. And, that, and that's by design. I, I don't like it if you have to click here, then click on the assignment folder, then click on the solution folder. I, I don't do it that way at all. And you guys have all had me, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, I am going to turn the edit mode off. So this is how you guys are seeing it right now. So you're seeing my welcome message, which will go away after tonight. Um, Zoom link and the e-textbook stuff will stay at the top for those of you that use the Cengage uh, e-textbook program. Um, and then all your units of instruction. I'm going to go ahead and click into unit zero here in just a second. But I do want to show you all the sidebar links here. So all the unit folders will appear here. Announcements, uh, like the ones I sent out before the course started, um, all will show up in your email. So when I put something in there, you get an email. So that tells you something that email is important to check all the time. If you're not in the habit of checking your gateway email at least once a day, I'm going to suggest that you strongly change that habit. That I would say like a couple times a day is probably pertinent uh, as a student. Um, any communication I do with you will go through email. Announcements, go to email. But just in case you want to relive the glory of them, you can come in here and read them. You know, So they're all listed here. If you thought like you, you deleted the message and you don't remember what I said, you can come here and find it. Um, and you'll recognize these messages as the ones that I just sent out uh, recently. All right. Um, there's the discussion board. We've talked about that. There's only two items in there. I don't really use that much. And then I also have the resources page here where I uh, have, once again, an ebook link, um, the code share environment, which I, I'm not sure how much we'll use that. It's been kind of buggy lately, but it's a way, like if I type up a, a complicated piece of code and I don't want to wait for you guys to type it, sometimes I'll just copy and paste it into this environment and then you, you can share, you know, or often also what I do is I just paste code into the chat, by the way. I have the resource files here, which means that all the PowerPoints that come with our textbook are, are shown here. And there's also data files. So whenever you read something in the book and they say, oh, there, you know, go to the, the student resource files and download whatever, it's in that zip file right there, right? Uh, I think the other thing that's also in there is if the author has coding examples in the chapter, those examples are also in that zip. Um, I have a bunch of useful links here, but I'm going to tell you what, um, I think we might want to revisit to see if, if many of these are accurate or not. And I'm going to kind of like review and maybe update this recently. It's, it's uh, due for a review. Um, but a lot of the, the things that we might be using or downloading here in class are listed here. All right, let me jump over now to uh, unit zero. Um, 
I, okay, one more thing before I get started here is I do also want to point out, and you can see see it right here, the My Grades section. This is where you will see your grades if you're brand new to Gateway. I don't think any of you are, but some people in the online section might be who are watching the video. If you need to send me an email, don't remember my email address or how to find it, uh, you can email through Blackboard. That's okay if you want to do it that way. A lot of students do do that. Um, those tools are right here on the sidebar as well. All right, so in the unit zero area, the material that we're covering basically is kind of an introduction to the course. Um, so I talk about what the course is about. I do a little bit of an introduction uh, about myself. Um, so I'm not gonna read that to you here. Um, probably the most notable part of, about it is, you know, most people here at Gateway call me Ty, um, but you're free to call me by my proper given name as well, which is Takis, like chips if you guys are familiar with those, uh, or Mr. Guinness, or whatever you're comfortable with. Uh, Ty is what most people call me, just so you know. Uh, I do have links here to the syllabus acknowledgement and the introduction. We've already talked about those. But I do want to talk a little bit about the hardware and the software piece right now. Um, and I want to like give you some really clear ideas as to how we're going to operate here. Ideally, if you're using equipment um, to do this class, you know, and I'm not trying to knock Max, but Max can have some issues doing Java stuff, especially when you do more complicated things. Um, but what you basically need ideally is a modern e computer equipment, either a laptop or a desktop, um, running typically Windows uh, 11 or 10. Um, I wouldn't go to any operating systems older than those, uh, they're basically pretty insecure at this point. Um, you can also use a Mac, or if you're a Linux person, you can use a Linux machine as well. Uh, it is possible to code whatever we do in this class on any of those platforms. What I strongly discourage you <clears throat> from doing is uh, using a tablet or a Chromebook or a phone. It's not that it's not possible, it is, it is absolutely possible to code on those platforms, but it's not a, not a true experience. You know, it, um, you're gonna struggle a lot with the tech to get it to work to do stuff. Uh, you're really much better off on a regular computer system. Um, I typically recommend that you have uh, at least eight gigs of RAM, really you should be at 16 these days if you're on a Windows machine. Uh, if you're on a Mac, you can get by with eight because of how the operating system works but 16 would be a functional minimum. If you're buying a brand new computer these days, I would go right to 32 gigs or 64 gigs, frankly. You know, if you're putting the money in, you may as well get a lot. Uh, hard drive space uh, becomes an issue with IT programs too. So a minimum high 500 gig hard drive is uh, recommended. I would personally say a terabyte or more is better. Um, and an SSD um, strongly encouraged because they operate that much faster. Most of the new machines that you buy these days that are, you know, above the five six hundred dollar level are coming with SSDs now and and all of these specs. So you should be okay if you you're in that price range. Be really careful if you're buying a computer that's like sub five hundred, you know. And I, and I think of all those like Walmart and Target like three hundred dollar laptops that they sell. They're they're fine for like surfing and doing stuff, but they're not fine for doing professional IT work. They, they really don't have the horsepower. Um, modern operating system, so whatever platform you're on, for, for a Windows machine, it's either Windows 10 or 11. Uh, Windows 12 is poised to come out soon, by the way. Um, you know, so that's gonna be uh, a thing. Uh, we prefer that you're either using the professional or the education version of Windows. I can show you how to get the license key for the education version if you're interested. Um, if you're on the Mac or a Linux OS, uh, a recent, you know, you know, in that world, you know, a recent Mac OS, uh, and if you're on Linux, a recent distro, you know, that's that's the lingo we use with, with Linux. Um, we will have the need to have some editors, and that's one of the next things that we're going to do here. Uh, it's still important to have access to all the standard things you need on a computer, so like a good web browser fast internet connection. Um, you need to have access to some sort of office suite. A lot of uh, students prefer to use like 
the Google stuff. So Google Documents, Google Sheets, uh, Google Drive, all of those products. Uh, but you also have available free of charge to you as a Gateway student. Um, you have Microsoft Office available as well. And I'm happy to demonstrate how to get those things if you, if you need that. I'm going to anticipate that most of the people here in the session don't need coaching on that. But if you do, let me know. I'm happy to provide the information. Um, we will likely need to use a, a number of different um, editors uh, to write code. Uh, there's many, many, many ways to write Java code. The crux of it really comes down to this, and, and, and this is kind of interesting. Once you have all the Java libraries installed on your computer, you can write Java code with any basic text editor. You don't really need fancy tools or ones that cost lots of money. However, professionals would, I'm not gonna say never use basic text editors, they sometimes do. The better the tool you use, the better success you have, right? So for example, if I was a carpenter and I went to the hardware store to buy a hammer, I'm not gonna go to the dollar store and buy the one that's gonna fall apart after I swing it three times. I'm going to go and buy that like $95 Stanley hammer that can take abuse and be with me for a lifetime, right? And I'll have more success with that hammer than the cheap one from the dollar store, you know? And so I'm going to push you to use more professional tools um, for Java as opposed to using lightweight tools that really are kind of like learning tools and not really professional tools. So my focus is more on having you use professional tools. The primary... Um, IDE that we'll use in this class by my preference is Eclipse. That's the one that most Java programmers tend to use, but you can use, like I said, many, many, many different products. I'll talk about some of those in just a little bit here. I do have a little entry here at the bottom as well, talking about Zoom etiquette. These are just kind of, um, I'm just saying this for the Zoom students. These are, most of these are common sense things. I don't follow these as rules. It's just, um, a document that uh, Wendy Revolinsky had put together. I thought, you know what, this is nice. Let's put that in there, um, just in case people are new and have never used uh, Zoom before. Now, I, I'm just gonna let you guys know, Rio, Mike, and Ralph will all have their cameras off and I'm not asking you to turn it on. I know what all three of you look like. I've had you in class before. Um, you know, I, I have seen other instructors and frankly, other schools where if you're on Zoom for a class, if your camera's not on, they kick you out of the session, you know, and, and the thinking is they want you, they want to deliver the instruction to the actual person that's supposed to be there. So I get it. If you don't want to turn your camera on, that's fine. But I do appreciate that the camera's on when you do have them on. Um, and you know what? Uh, Mike's muted is kind of a thing too. Like for right now, like if you're looking at your Zoom participant window, you can see that Rolf has a yellow outline around his screen. What that means is he's got a lot of background noise. That's kind of like a volume meter. It's like Ralph's in a loud place. So if he hit the microphone button, it would probably be a problem, right? Um, for me, you know, when I'm in Zoom session and I go to meetings or classes, you know, classes I take, um, I usually leave my mic unmuted because I'm in the basement here. The, the loudest thing I'll get is maybe my dog, you know, calling and yelling and wanting to go outside, you know, for a bathroom break. That, that's about as much as I get for noise here. But, you know, if you just want to leave yourself muted, that's absolutely fine. I just would assume that you're engaged uh, in what's being delivered and the content. All right. So what we're going to do next is we're going to take a break. Um, we've reached that, that point in time. I, I am going to stop this recording. So that basically covers the syllabus, the introduction, um, expectations, and how the course shell works, and unit zero. And from here, we're gonna go into unit one, and I will create a fresh recording for unit one. So this recording ends here.